que titula Percepciones sociales y estado de bienestar, sostenibilidad y legitimidad, dos temas que se han mencionado a lo largo de la mañana. Y la presentación durará entre, pues, entre 30 o 35 minutos, 40 minutos, ya veremos el ritmo que lleva y luego tendremos eh, un ratito, pues como esta mañana también, para poderle plantear eh, preguntas directamente. Eh, sin más, le cedo la palabra y dentro de un rato pues podréis eh, alzar la mano y preguntar lo que queráis antes de pasar a la siguiente parte de la tarde. Thank you very much, Helena. Thanks very much to everyone for coming along. Um, I come from the UK. Uh, I like international travel, so it's very nice to be able uh, to come to Spain. Uh, and I'm a researcher who spent most of his time looking at the welfare state, so I understand the importance of social cohesion and cooperation and inclusiveness as a foundation for welfare states. So I also like very much coming to the Basque country, so thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I want to talk about the crisis uh, and the implications for social welfare reform. Uh, the quotation, never waste a good crisis, uh, is attributed to Donald Rumsfeld, uh, to Hillary Clinton and to a large number of other people. But it does sum something up, uh, and that is that Crises are usually understood to be situations in which the current settlement becomes unstable. So they're situations in which it may be possible to move in new directions. So the question really uh, for people interested in progressive reforms are whether crises give opportunities to move in a progressive direction. I'm really raising the issues about the crisis in this kind of way because as somebody who spent quite a long time looking at comparative social policy and welfare state issues, I generally find that the conferences I go to are surrounded by an atmosphere of gloom and depression. Now, The quality of the gloom and depression tends to change depending on what's actually going on in the world and uh, where you are. There's more gloom in some countries than others and there's more gloom at some times than others. But in general, discussions about the future of the welfare state for quite a long time have tended to take the line that the future will be a time where welfare states will be on the defensive, where it will be increasingly difficult to maintain the kinds of standards that the generations born after the Second World War and in the 1960s enjoyed. And just to clarify that, I think We ought to remember that literature about crises in the welfare state has been around for quite a long time. Of course, now, when we discuss crisis, we often think of what you might call the immediate crisis. What I've got in mind is the banking crisis in 2007-8, uh, the economic crises that followed that, Uh, the recession in 2008-9 dragging on into 2010 for some countries. That's just a bit of rhetoric, really, uh, a diagram, a graph from the IEF World Economic Outlook figures that shows you economic growth rates and showed how dramatically they dipped for the major European and the Mediterranean countries about that time. Uh, and then I'm not sure if you can actually read the years uh, in the middle, but going on after 2010, recovery uh, more dramatic in places like Sweden and Germany, to some extent in France, then the second dip of the recession 
uh, particularly striking in some countries, not so striking in others. Very serious problem uh, for Spain, of course. Uh, Spain, this dotted line here. Uh, quite a serious issue for the UK. Being from the UK, I always uh, think the UK is worth paying attention to. So I put that in as a dotted line as well, so you can uh, see which one it is. It's a yellow dotted line. Anyway, we tend to think of the crisis in terms of patterns of economic growth recently. And we tend then to go on and think about the impact on government spending. Uh, that's the IMF uh, figures from World Economic Outlook of total government spending. So, of course, it does include military spending. Uh, it includes debt interest payments and some other areas. But most of it is spending on social welfare in the countries that are mentioned. And again, you can see the response to the uh, economic... Sorry, it's not what I intended to do. Uh, where are we? Yeah, uh, you see the response to the uh, economic crisis, the spike, uh, particularly dramatic, of course, for Ireland because there was such a dramatic collapse in um, GDP. And here, public spending is expressed as a percentage of uh, gross domestic product. So, of course, if gross domestic product uh, collapses and all things stay equal, the proportion, the, uh, proportion of GDP represented by social expenditure will automatically increase. doesn't mean you get any more spending in real terms. just means you're comparing it with something that's ra become suddenly rather smaller. But anyway, you get the spike as... Uh, GDP falls in countries uh, as automatic regulators like unemployment benefits uh, kick in as governments decide to apply stimulus packages of various kinds, uh, supporting skilled workers, uh, supporting particular industries, the subsidies for cars in countries like the US, the UK and Germany, for example, uh, the short-time working support in many European countries, all costing more. And then you get the situation we're living in now, uh, which is the gentle decline in social spending. As one moves into the future, so I'm trying to keep my mouth near enough to the microphone so you can actually hear what I say, uh, but we're, of course, in 2012. The interesting thing about the IMF is it's one of the few agencies that actually confidently predicts the future. It's always a bit risky, really. Uh, chances of actually guessing what gross domestic product in a range of countries is going to be for the next five years and getting right how much they're going to spend on social welfare and on other areas is always a little bit uncertain. So what this tells you really is not so much what's absolutely certain to happen, but it does tell you what governments think will happen. And there are two factors there. One is the environment, the economic environment that governments think they'll find themselves in, but also, and interestingly for our purposes, there's the policies that governments are pursuing and what they think they'll do to their total public expenditure and within that, their social expenditure as time goes on. And the point I want to make about this graph is it shows a gentle decline. Sharper in some countries than others, let me find Spain, of course. Spain coming down. Sorry? Did I miss something? I've got the wrong one. I always do this. Um, but uh, declining to the bottom of the uh, European League. I always like the UK. You can see, actually, the slope on the UK graph 
is steeper than anyone else other than Ireland. Why a reasonably well-developed and reasonably wealthy country like the UK should choose to cut in the way that it is is a puzzle to many people, but it is. If you include other advanced countries uh, uh, and look at those, the G7 countries, for example, you can see how the UK moves from the middle of that group of countries to the bottom. And this is a good illustration, I think, of the shift to the right in the UK government and the commitment to liberal policies in the UK. But getting back to the situation in Spain, you can also see the decline in social sp in spending in the UK. Uh, in, try again, Spain, taking it down towards the bottom of the league. Now, those are the issues that, as I understand it, we tend to have in mind when we think about crisis. That's the immediate crisis. Uh, banking collapse, double dish recession, continued stagnation, very serious problems, particularly for Ireland and the Mediterranean countries, applications for loans, very sharp pressures on social spending. What I want to suggest, however, is we have to situate that bit of gloom in the context of a more general gloom, the kind of discussion that's been around in social policy circles about longer-run pressures on the welfare state, pressures which were really emerged in discussion in the 1980s and 1990s are to do really with factors like population ageing, uh, possibly most importantly, also with the difficulties that countries face in managing public services and particularly human services in a way that increases productivity in them so that productivity gains in that area can be brought to the same level as they are across the economy as a whole. If you think about it, if you've got people working in healthcare, education, social care and so on and their return is presumably justified in some sense by what they actually do and produce, what good they do. And you've got other people working in a marketed sector where their return is immediately accounted, where there are great pressures to increase the return all the time. If the first group don't increase their return at the rate that the second group has, and of course in some sectors of the economy we've had very rapid increases in productivity as a result of uh, the introduction of information technology, new management techniques, automation and so on. And it's been very difficult to parallel those increases in human services so that in general over time the cost of standing still in human services increases, that the economy has to transfer a greater and greater proportion of resources <laughs> to human services, or at least that's the kind of argument that's used. Of course, there have been enormous efforts in the area of human services and particularly in health, education and welfare to improve productivity. There are huge difficulties in measuring productivity in these areas because you have to take into account not only what people do in terms of the number of children they teach or uh, the number of patients that are dealt with in hospitals, but you also have to take into account the quality of what they do. Surely that's part of the output of human services. So the extent to which patients are treated with respect 
in hospitals as human beings, perhaps is part of the output you should take into account. You can take into account in education things like levels of exam grades uh, attained, but do you want to also include issues like the extent to which children are educated as democratic citizens, participate in their own learning and in directing it and so on, because you might want to think of those as something that you should be achieving and is part of the output of education. So you can see it's very difficult to produce measures of productivity in human services that will parallel the kind of measures that you can use, for example, in the manufacture of cars, where the production of so many cars for so much resources and success in selling them at whatever price it is, give you statistical measures which are relatively easy to deploy. But nonetheless, having walked around this circle and probably confused you mightily, I would suggest that an important part in the debate uh, about the long-run pressures on the welfare state is the issue of, wa of wage pressure, difficulties in improving the output of human services to anything like the same extent has been achieved in manufacturing industry and a long run pressure therefore on wages. Well, the huge litany, I won't go into it in here, I've got a written version of the paper which discusses it in a bit more detail, of attempts to improve efficiency in human services all the systems of outsourcing, introducing competitive markets, uh, greater use of information technology, for example, in medical records in education and so on, uh, use of uh, management, different management techniques through targeting and trying to ensure that particular targets are maintained uh, through imposing efficiency saving cuts every year that force managers to organize services so they operate within particular budgets and so on and many other methods. I find it very difficult to get access to good data across Europe as a whole. There's quite a lot of work I'm familiar with in the UK, and that generally shows that over the period since about the mid-90s to the present, and it's difficult to get good data, really, that measures quality before the mid-90s, all these efforts have essentially achieved what you might call a standstill, Essentially, product, the cost of human services has paralleled the output. So they haven't actually cost any more, but there hasn't been any real savings. And that's been what you might call a success, something that's required very considerable effort by different governments pursuing different combinations of policies over a period of time. So the kind of message that's tended to float around in the social policy literature, focusing for a long time on these issues of population ageing and of problems of maintaining productivity in human services, has argued these are very serious problems that they require continual attention by social services. So what you end up with is something like a war of attrition in the way the welfare state works. That there will, for the foreseeable future, as populations age, there will be continual pressure just to keep the cost down just to stand still. And that's the kind of atmosphere in which debates are being conducted. Don't know if you come across the American scholar Paul Pearson, who's very influential in this area. Some of you may have. He famously summed all this up as permanent austerity. And the claim was that as time goes on, what welfare states face is permanent austerity. And that's the long-run crisis. I haven't said anything that's 
he was writing that round about 2000, uh, before the immediate crisis affected us, and the immediate crisis has created more serious problems of spending cuts. Issues about the long-run crisis, if you want to take it a bit further, the long-run crisis really applies most pressingly to services for older people and for the mass of the population, services like pensions, health care, which is generally consumed very much more by older people than by any other population group, uh, as services uh, that, that include education, uh, social care, and so on. It doesn't apply so much to the benefits that are concerned mainly with redistribution from the mass to the minority, vertical redistribution from better off people to the poor, unemployed people, single parents, uh, sick disabled people and others. It doesn't really apply so much to spending that's targeted on poor groups because they're poor. Now, when one starts to discuss the future politics of the welfare state in this context and people debate how the long-term crisis will affect the politics of the welfare state, they generally end up with the assumption that the situation will be the situation of permanent austerity. There will always be cost pressures. There will always be difficulties about taxation and paying for the thing. So... What will happen over time is that the majority services, the things that most people expect they'll need at some stage in their life, and they hope to need pensions, uh, I certainly do next year, in fact, hooray, uh, But because uh, I've got to that stage, but uh, also um, most people need and believe they would need to have good, secure health care available. They may need social care for their relatives and their families. Things like education they need uh, for their children. Those kinds of services will tend to consume more and more of the spending, and they will tend to drive out the less popular minority services, which are benefits essentially directed at poor people, or homelessness programmes for poor people, programmes directed at minorities. And that's a real issue for the politics of the welfare state as one looks to the future. It becomes a war of attrition in political terms, and it becomes a conflict, a struggle between the mass and the minority. And you can see that as a struggle between better off and worse off, between comfortable and vulnerable groups. But it's a struggle in which, particularly if you live in gloomy countries like the UK, you can guess who is going to win. What's going to happen is that services for the poor are going to get worse over time and services for the mass will keep going. There is an alternative, of course, which is that you increase taxation radically over time and you maintain uh, services because society just directs more of its resources uh, to the welfare state. But it's very difficult to see that happening on a large scale, I think. So... That's the long-term gloom picture. Well, I've spent quite a lot of time mentioning the immediate crisis, the crisis due to banking collapse, recession, stagnation. Let me just say a bit about how that crisis, the second crisis, the immediate crisis, relates to discussion of social welfare. Of course, it's been endlessly discussed, and you must be familiar with all the political discussions and debates that we've had about the future of social spending and how it would be financed across Europe. But in general, I think it's true to say that the response has tended to be at the liberal end of the range of possible responses. To put it very crudely, in uh, 
democratic capitalist societies of the kind uh, that European democracies pursue, uh, so leaving out socialist uh, uh, societies, leaving out moves to the extreme right, uh, the range of possibilities for political economy really lies between some kind of Keynesian approach and a kind of liberal approach. And the trend over the last 20 years has been towards liberal market approaches. And when one looks at crises uh, of this kind, I suppose the key difference is that the Keynesian approach would tend to see the crisis as a cycle in uh, the development of capitalist uh, market economies. It would tend to argue that the real problem is that there are resources, people who are unemployed, factories that are not producing, enterprises that are not operating effectively, that there are resources lying idle. And there is a role for government in supporting those resources and in investing in providing the capital to help the economy to continue to develop. The real problem is that the private sector is not investing enough, so the government substitutes for the private sector and helps to restart the move towards full utilisation of economic resources. So there's an argument for the state to invest, and then there are discussions about how much it's sensible to borrow, essentially, from future growth to spend in investment now, uh, what the terms on which one can borrow those kinds of resources are, and so on. There's debate about public spending and uh, debt and uh, debt crises and so on. And, of course, these are played out very differently in different countries depending on their local circumstances. At the liberal end of the spectrum, the problem is much more understood as a problem of private markets uh, and the problem of competitiveness and of attaining the most efficient possible economic structure and of possibly increasing pressures which will lead to structural changes, uh, the removal of stickinesses in the economy, and so on, so that the solution is much more in terms of removing obstacles to the private market to operate. The argument is that the private sector will invest if it sees good profitable opportunities to do so, and that the state and state intervention tends to be an obstacle to that, that the state can crowd out the private sector. So there's a lot of emphasis on reducing taxation and reducing public spending in order to help to kickstart the economy. And approaches to the crises, of course, have varied in different countries. But in general, they've been more towards the liberal end of that spectrum and have involved cutbacks, privatisations of services, reductions in the scope of the state uh, than they've been towards the Keynesian end, though there are lots of examples of investment that you can find, of course. And so there are all sorts of struggles over where cuts fall, uh, how cuts are managed, whether cuts are to be embedded as a permanent feature of uh, the welfare state system through structural reforms or whether they're simply a temporary, address, a temporary issue to deal with a particular crisis and so on. Uh, here, just to mention, and again, I don't know if it's boring if I talk about the UK, but I'm very much wrapped up in what's going on there, so I tend to. But it's very interesting to note that the UK government, not only does it have this 
Well, slightly puzzling approach to public spending in that it's cutting very much more rapidly than any other comparable government, government at the same level of economic development that can borrow money as, as easily as they can and so on. So it's got that puzzling aspect. But there's another puzzling and very interesting thing about the UK, and that is as well as the very rapid cuts, it's embarked on a program of wholesale restructuring, reorganisation of pretty well every aspect of uh, state activity, including the whole of the welfare sector. Now, you can understand this in various ways, and there are all sorts of arguments about it, but one interesting issue, I think, is that there is a programme of trying to change the system so that you can embed the cuts, so that state spending in the UK will continue downwards on the current trajectory for quite a long time, and it will move the UK to a very different kind of political economy, a uh, kind of economic model than it's had throughout the post-war period. Uh, and this is something that I find very interesting, in you, and particularly in the UK context. I'm not sure how generalisable this is. I think the UK has very particular features of its governmental system with the Westminster model and so on, which means that it governments can do very dramatic, sudden changes in policy. And in public life, in general, the left is fairly weak, that trade unions are very weak, and there isn't a sort of serious uh, political force anywhere further across than the centre-left, if you like, so that uh, probably resistance to these kinds of changes is weaker in the UK than in many European countries. But I do think it's an illustration of programmes that not only respond to the, seize the crisis as a good opportunity to make cuts, but as a good opportunity to embed those cuts permanently. And that's, I think, an interesting issue about the UK. may not apply uh, so much to other countries, but certainly the discourse about cuts has been important elsewhere. Well... I've got lots of slides here, and I can go on a long time about them, but I've probably talked. Pardon? You have five minutes. So I have five minutes, so I'll make the important point uh, and then shut up. Uh, now, the interesting question is, in this context, is it... Just trying to find the uh, correct slide. Uh, doesn't mean anything until I explain what it means. Uh, but in this context, is it possible uh, to think of whether there are opportunities for progressive moves? And I was trying to think of a way that you could be optimistic, you see. As I explained, I've spent most of my life going to conferences where people are generally gloomy about the future and say there are these long-run pressures on the welfare state, so... The future is a war of attrition and a war of the mass against the minority. And guess what? The mass is going to win. So, you know, the major services will survive, but redistribution will become less important a component and the poor will do badly and inequalities will increase. That's been the general sort of atmosphere. And then we've suddenly got this other crisis, the economic crisis, come along. Uh, and, you know, that involves cutbacks and liberal reforms, possibly makes it worse for the poor, uh, but maybe affects welfare across the board. Now, it's quite difficult to get a good picture on what is actually happening in the detail of welfare services across Europe that's sufficiently up-to-date to enable you to comment on this successfully. There's some work by OECD which attempts to survey member countries and look at what they're doing in terms of their recovery packages. Of course, OECD, Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development, isn't centrally interested in welfare issues. It's much more interested in economic issues, but it does study welfare as a sideline, as it were. And when it looks at how different countries make budget cuts, uh, it looks at uh, 
which areas they make cuts in. And of course, it's welfare that's the biggest area of cuts. Services, which is essentially services for unemployed people, and the poor, services directed at groups because they are poor, uh, some housing and so on. Uh, health comes on the list, pensions next, 48%. Uh, and, very, and, and when you look at services that are shielded, protected from cuts, uh, welfare in only 4% of their 21 of their 29 countries, I, very unimportant, uh, shielding health, uh, very shielded, uh, not very shielded, and so on. Education, however, is very different. Uh, education's only targeted for cuts in 17% of the countries, as opposed to 62% for welfare or 52% for pensions, uh, shielded in 17%. The cuts in education are almost all pay cuts, actually, uh, for the personnel. They're, they're, they're not cuts in uh, the services. And they sum up, well, there are some quotations. It's things like unemployment benefits that are hit. Uh, and economic growth, education, R&D, infrastructure, uh, though tend to be shielded from cuts, seen as important. And you can see why. People see these as services that are an investment in the country, in the future, in future productive capacity, that they're essential to promote growth. Uh, you see that part of Obama's plan in the States, for example, was uh, actually 2% of GDP extra on education. It's a huge increase in education spending. Germany has increased education spending. The UK has cut it, of course, but the UK is unusual. And there are these areas which you might see as social investment, which are coming to the fore. Now, what's interesting, I do have some slides on this, but I won't go through them. I'll just explain the point as quickly as I can, is whether one can build on that to try to change the long-term arguments about the future of the welfare state, whether one can make the case that more redistributive uh, welfare and welfare that improves the opportunities of a greater proportion of the population is actually something that it's essential to preserve and to build up because it will help the future capacity of government to produce, uh, of the country to produce. It will help the future of the economy. And in this area, there are arguments, for example, about childcare provision, uh, because childcare provision not only, if it's managed and regulated properly, can, can improve the life chances and opportunities of the children who receive the care, it can also release more mothers uh, to work. Uh, it can improve, therefore, the, the size of the labour force, the productive capacity, and it can improve the tax take of the government. And there's quite a lot of work trying to do cost-benefit type analyses on what kind of childcare you would need, whom you'd need to target it on, and so on. And there are other arguments about essentially expanding education. And there are arguments about uh, the extent to which issues of inequality are damaging to the economic capacity of society. People like Richard Wilkinson, of course, argue very powerfully in this area. I think he possibly exaggerates the uh, position he's in. But nonetheless, I think you can maintain arguments that say that extreme inequality is damaging because it increases the amount of resources you have to deploy inefficiently simply to maintain security, to control riots and so on. So what I'm trying to suggest is that we may be in a situation where, surprisingly, there are uh, real opportunities to develop progressive arguments for the welfare state. And people like me, possibly not you, but people like me, actually find this quite surprising because, as I say, I've been used lots and lots of years going to conferences where people are generally slightly depressed and gloomy. And they're depressed and gloomy because they think the future is all about a continual war of attrition, 
uh, a problem of uh, maintaining standards and they think that because they're aware of these issues of population, ageing and uh, price effects and their uh, wage effects and they're concerned that the future is really a struggle between services for the mass and services for the minority and the minority lose and life gets more unequal. But I wonder if in the current context it's possible to make much stronger arguments for different directions in welfare states and if elements in that might be positive. Okay, that's really what I've got to say, thank so you thank so you. Much. Thank you. Bueno, se introduce así el tema de algún modo de, de la inversión social, ¿no? Eh, ahora tenemos un ratito poquito, sé que nos hemos atrasado un poco, pero también nos hemos, hemos empezado más tarde, así que si queréis hacer alguna pregunta tenemos unos minutos, eh, yo aprovecharía la ocasión y luego ya pasaríamos a la parte del debate más político. Así que adelante a quien quiera hacer alguna pregunta. No nada. Bueno, pues yo voy a aprovechar para hacer una que me interesa. Yo por lo que estoy entendiendo, por lo que estoy entendiendo, eh, parece que habría pues nuevas oportunidades de alguna manera pasando eh, a unas políticas de eh, mayor atención a nuevos riesgos sociales en contraposición a políticas que fundamentalmente se han basado en los clásicos o tradicionales eh, riesgos sociales, ¿no? Mi pregunta sería, eh, si, eh, ¿qué reacción tendría una población que los estudios parecen demostrar o parecen indicar ¿no? que hay una opinión bastante estable que se mantiene durante el tiempo en la población eh, en relación con qué es lo que entiende como una protección social legítima? O sea, ¿qué riesgos le parece legítimo proteger? ¿no? Y, de forma bastante estable, la población parece eh, estar de acuerdo en que los criterios para considerar legítima eh, una determinada medida de protección social pues sería, eh, pues por ejemplo, eh, una es que la persona o las personas se encuentren o ese colectivo se encuentre en esa situación de forma involuntaria, es decir, que no es responsable de lo que le ocurre. Ese suele ser un criterio para que a uno le parezca legítima una política, ¿no? Por ejemplo, eh, por eso se consideran siempre legítimas las políticas en favor de las personas con discapacidad, porque están en una situación, de alguna manera, de la que no son responsables. También hay criterios eh, que parecen eh, indicar que se defiende eh, o que uno considera legítimo una política eh, que atiende eh, a personas que ya han contribuido al sistema. ¿no? Eh, hay otros criterios que son la de, bueno, es legítimo... Eh, atender a los nuestros, a los cercanos, ¿no? a los que nos caen cerca. Es decir, hay una serie de criterios que determinan que la gente opine de unas determinadas maneras con respecto a la protección social. Y esos criterios han hecho que, de forma bastante estable, se vea que en la opinión pública eh, se considera legítimo atender, y por este orden, a las personas mayores, a las personas con discapacidad, a las personas en situación de desempleo, creo recordar, y, por último, a la población inmigrante. En ese orden suelen ser las, las opiniones a este respecto. ¿no? De alguna manera, mi pregunta es, eh, teniendo en cuenta esas opiniones o la estabilidad de esa pauta de opinión en las sociedades a nivel internacional y durante muchos años, eh, ¿cómo reaccionaría una población si, de forma bastante notable, se viera un giro eh, un, un cambio en, la, en el protagonismo que se da a unas políticas sobre otras. Es decir, en qué medida, cómo reaccionaría la población si eh, hubiera eh, mayor apoyo a políticas de inversión social en detrimento, cuando sean en detrimento, de otras políticas que no son de inversión social, sino que son más de protección social. ¿no? Esa sería mi pregunta. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a very interesting issue. Uh, it's, uh, well, as uh, Helena has explained, there are a substantial number of uh, 
cross-European attitude studies, international social survey project, European social survey and some other ones, and I've been involved in some of them as well, uh, that essentially show this very stable common pattern to attitudes uh, and uh, to support for different groups. And basically there's a hierarchy that elderly people uh, score highest, then disabled people, unemployed people. Sorry, yes. can you hear? Uh, 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 sorry, is it? No, they, they weren't translating. Oh. Sorry, you go on, go on. Uh, I give up. <laughs> uh, they, um, uh, and uh, unemployed people and uh, poor people at the bottom. And that's fairly consistent, and surprisingly consistent across a l whole range of European countries. So they've all got big cultural differences. Uh, and... Uh, real question is, is that going to change over time? Do you see it changing? Uh, well, I don't know. I think if it doesn't change now, it's unlikely to change at any time. Uh, but also, what I wonder is, and this is what a lot of the debates among people in sort of social democratic circles in the UK are about, whether it's possible to get round this kind of attitude structure in some way. That's why this idea of investment is a very interesting idea, because it's presenting social welfare not as social welfare, and you're not emphasising the direction of social welfare to give to the poor or to redistribute. You're trying to emphasise some notion of what can be seen as a common good in contributing to production in the future. And I think it is quite an interesting idea, uh, really. There's another idea, shall, shall I mention this, uh, to do, uh, th that's also very fashionable at present, and this is to do with putting much more emphasis on regulation rather than on state provision. So the tradition of the welfare state has been taxing, providing services, uh, providing cash benefits and so on. Uh, but it's very difficult in the current context to propose increases in tax. I gather you were talking this morning about increases in co-payments. In the UK, that would just would not take you anywhere at all. Uh, you know, you would not get people to vote for you on that basis. Uh, but, uh, and you certainly would not get people to vote for you if you propose increases in taxation in the UK. Uh, but uh, the idea then is to Try, is to see how far you can go in moving the state to regulate the private sector. One very important thing in the UK, of course, is minimum wage uh, legislation, which has been very effective indeed and been very successful in reducing poverty at the bottom end. But things like uh, legislating to compel employers to provide a uh, range of occupational welfare schemes, you might include things like uh, nurseries, training programmes for low-skilled staff, uh, which various times they have uh, had and so on. Uh, and uh, there are other issues about the amount of regulatory power you use in relation to, for example, the utilities, the power, uh, water and so on, that everybody's forced to buy, uh, and, and the pricing programmes. Just to mention one thing, it's often argued that regulation is a substitute for state spending, not sure this is quite true. You actually do have to spend quite a lot of money in order to enforce regulation effectively. And there are very many examples of attempts at regulation which don't really work because they're uh, circumvented by the private sector. A big statutory sick pay scheme which forced employers to provide sick pay in the UK. It was only after it had been running for some time uh, that they discovered how many employers actually had sort of transferred their staff to the statutory sick pay, which was advantageous because it was subsidised by the state through the tax system. But they were still just going on working and nobody had bothered to check this, so you didn't find them until you had a regulation mechanism. And it's, you know, it's not not trivial making regulation work, but I think it's an idea. Desde que llegó al gobierno, el gobierno, el nuevo gobierno británico.
ha desarrollado una estrategia que ha llamado The Big Society, la gran sociedad, en la que, en la que ha intentado ampliar el margen de actuación de las entidades de voluntariado, de las asociaciones, fundaciones del tercer sector. Eh, a mí me gustaría que, que valorar esa estrategia, eh, qué resultados está teniendo esa mayor implicación comunitaria o esa búsqueda de una mayor implicación comunitaria, de una mayor participación de las entidades sociales en términos tanto de, de, de costes, de eficiencia, como en términos de legitimidad social. Si podemos pensar, hoy por la mañana hemos hablado también de, de, de servicios sociales de, de base más comunitaria, si esa estrategia puede tener algún sentido en términos de, de mejorar la, la, la sostenibilidad social y económica de los servicios sociales. Yes, I mean, that's a very interesting issue. Uh, I mean, the UK, the big society, is not a serious policy. It's candy floss. It's propaganda, uh, really. Uh, and the reason for this is that the way the voluntary... Uh, the UK has a substantial third sector, voluntary sector NGOs. If you list the number of societies and people's involvement in them, it's very large. Uh, but there are two issues. One is that most of the third sector is not directed to welfare ends. Uh, it's directed to things like research for a very small range of uh, medical conditions, uh, to support for prestigious middle and upper class welfare institutions. Some of the biggest recipients in total of charitable aid are Oxbridge colleges in the UK, if you actually look at the figures. Uh, and these uh, cater for a very small minority of the ruling class base. Basically, uh, so or, or the private schools. Um, so there's that issue. It's not well adapted to dealing with welfare issues. The other issue is that certainly in the UK, and um, I suspect elsewhere, there was an involvement of some NGOs in charitable, uh, in uh, welfare work, particularly in social care for older people and for children uh, and delivering services. But typically they did that under contract to local authorities. So the state was actually paying them to deliver the services. Uh, and they were probably quite cost effective basically because they can bring in some uh, resources they're not paying for. Uh, but that's not the crucial thing. They needed to be paid to, to deliver the services, and there is a huge crisis now, and many charities have actually collapsed because the amount of money has been cut, because spending by local government has been cut by 27%. If you actually cut something by 27%, that hasn't all come in yet. It will come in, we'll finish next, if you, next year. So if you cut something by 27% in the space of three years, you know, services just disappear. You can't do it. Uh, and that has actually affected a lot of NGOs. So the bottom line of that is if you want a thriving NGO sector, it goes hand in hand with the state. It's not a substitute. It's something that needs to be supported and directed and managed and paid for. Sí. Eh, usted eh, nos ha hablado de, de las políticas futuras de, del Estado de Bienestar para entrar en una situación de austeridad permanente por los problemas de recaudación. Eh, concretamente, estamos en una crisis a largo plazo, lo cual quiere decir que, de alguna manera, el logro del Estado de Bienestar que la sociedad, digamos, ha conseguido y que las, las, eh, digamos, la gente que sale en este momento a la, a la calle en movimientos populares, 15M, está reivindicando ese estado de bienestar, quiere decir que nos tenemos que ir, según su planteamiento, y nos olvidando, porque ahora se está hablando aquí fundamentalmente de pobreza, son temas de caridad, etcétera, etcétera, pero están muy alejados del estado de bienestar que hemos conseguido. ¿Nos tenemos que ir olvidando un poco del estado de bienestar? Esa es la pregunta. Yes, well, that's another good question and a very difficult one, and I don't know the answer to it. Uh, are we to forget where, uh, what, what's been achieved by 
the welfare state? I don't know. Um, it's... I think it would differ in different countries. And of course, I mean, I didn't discuss them in any detail, but the graphs about public spending and about economic crisis just show how different the different countries' economic situations are. I do find it very difficult to get a good understanding of what the political situations are now in different countries. You can get data, you know, two or three years ago very easily. Uh, but, but to know what's going on now and what the defence of the welfare state is, is very difficult indeed. But I do get the impression from things like the Occupy movement, the fact that there have been some left and centre-left governments elected recently, and the strength of resistance to cuts in some of the countries, particularly in the Mediterranean countries, that there are possibilities of a shift, and a shift in defence of the welfare state. So, so that's a reason for being optimistic. I, is that an answer? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much.